This story starts out with my four friends who are for privacy purposes, let's call them. Antony, Fred, Ron, and Junior. Antony booked an airbin for his birthday, and we were planning to just relax and drop some acid. Me, Antony, and Ron have done acid in the past, and it was a great experience. For background purposes, I've experimented heavily with acid for the past three years, dropping upwards to almost five tabs at once, so I know what to expect when doing acid. However, this trip caught me completely off guard. Fred and Junior have always been curious about acid and wanted to drop it with us for their first time. We're all close friends, so we thought it'd be a nice experience to try. So, we get to our Airbnb, which is a cozy two-story wooden cabin. We all decided to take one tab each. Fred and Junior were hesitant on taking one full tab, but eventually agreed to it since we all were going to take one full tab. This is where I should have realized that maybe we should have taken a half or even a quarter since I didn't know the dosage of each tab. However, I've always got acid from this dealer and knew he was a reliable source as my previous trips were always safe regarding the doses and legitimacy of the LSD. Okay, now we all take the tab at 3 p.m. For the first 45 minutes, it was going well. We were watching the Garden of Words and talking about life and our relationships and such. About another 45 minutes pass, and this is where the red flags start popping up. We all decide to go downstairs and just chill while I make food. Fred, Antony, and Ron are starting to lose themselves. Their sentences become incoherent and are unable to understand what me and Junior are saying, even though it was Junior's first time taking acid. He held himself together quite well and was taking care of Fred, Antony, and Ron. Antony then stubs his toe on a chair and starts bleeding. This is when the nightmare starts. Antony is in pain, then starts to say, security check about every 20 seconds. I believe the injury towards Antony's toe started making him paranoid about the whole cabin, as he rented it in his name and wanted to make sure it's safe and such. So, for about 30-40 minutes, he's repeating the phrase, security check. During this time, Frame Fred and Ron are tripping out hard. They're starting to lose themselves completely. Fred is talking incoherent gibberish with Antony, while Antony is in pain and repeating security check. Ron is sitting down by himself f out of his mind. He couldn't understand a word I said or what was going on. So, me and Junior help the three of them upstairs to relax and lay down a bit. I bring up the food I made while Antony is still saying security check over and over. This is when Ron and Fred fall asleep. No clue how someone falls asleep on acid. We had some nice lo-fi beats playing to lighten the mood. However, I don't think this helped. Me and Junior are still in our right mind and just chilling until Fred wakes up and starts acting strange. He tried doing a judo move on Junior. Junior thought this was normal behavior because we're into combat sports and spar a lot. This was the first big red flag. Fred then goes to me to try to judo flip me, but I counter it and we end up in the bed. I asked him if he's good, then he quickly replied, Yeah, I'm good, but awkwardly fast. Every time he talked it was like he was rapping like Eminem. He was speaking like this since we were downstairs. This is when shit gets weird. Fred then goes to Ron who is sleeping and proceeds to gouge his F face out while asking if Ron is okay. Fred keeps his fingernails really long for some reason so if he got to Ron's eyes it would have been bad. We move Ron away from Fred and try to get him to relax a bit because right now me and Junior start to realize that Fred is not okay. Fred then starts spazzing the F out. He falls onto the floor, then slams his leg onto Ron's head, who is sleeping on the floor. Fred is still spazzing out, rolling on the floor back and forth, and getting into weird, contorted positions with his body like from the movie The Exorcist. He was also chanting and mumbling random shit, while spazzing out on the floor like a psychotic crackhead. At this point Antony is coming back to his senses, and is like what the F is he doing? Now this is when shit really hits the fan. Upon seeing this, I go to the speaker to turn down the music. This is when Fred stands up and walks towards me asking what I'm doing. I say, just turning down the music bro, 
as I'm still a little freaked out by him. He pushes me violently aside and proceeds to grab the speaker and smash it on the ground. He then grabs the cord that was attached to the speaker and pulls on it while screaming, what does it all mean, at the top of his lungs. This scares the living F out of me, Antony, and Junior all while Ron is still asleep through all of this. At this point, we're all freaked out by what Fred does. Fred proceeds to walk to the staircase, but along the way he palm strikes Ron who is starting to sit up. This causes Ron to fall back to the ground and go to sleep again. Not sure if he got knocked out. Fred also strikes me in the jaw right after hitting Ron causing my jaw to slightly dislocate didn't find out until after the trip. While this is happening, it tells him to chill out, and I shit you not. Fred responds in the most demonic voice, chill out, no you chill out, like he sounded like a legit satanic demon saying that. After Fred hit my jaw, my first instinct is to clinch and take him to the ground. I've trained BJJ or Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for almost a year by then, so my instincts just kicked in, we hit the ground and I pin him with the help of Junior. Remember this is Junior's first time taking acid as well, so he's freaking the F out by what was happening to Fred. Fred is violent as F and is strong as F on the ground. He's struggling and chanting random shit to himself like he's possessed or something. He breaks free a couple times and attacks everyone. He smashed Antony's face in with a closed fist repeatedly until I got him off. He's also kicking anyone in front of him as we pin him, all while trying to bite us. He would scratch, hit, bite, or do anything he could to harm us. Every time we pin him, he arched his back like that one scene from The Exorcist where the girl is walking down the stairs like a spider. Thank God I knew BJJ because Fred looked like he was set on killing all of us. This was a nightmare. His pupils were dilated to the point where his whole eye was just black. He would glare at me and Junior as we're pinning him down. By far this was so creepy as I thought he was a demon. Fred is screaming gibberish and making weird noises while trying to contort his body like the girl from The Exorcist. At times he would arch his back and stick his tongue out while trying to throw up while making the most demonic noises I've ever heard. What he was doing was straight from a horror movie and it creeped me the F out. At 8 p.m., this is when Ron wakes up. When Ron wakes up, he couldn't believe what was happening. He thought that he died during the acid trip and is now in hell. Reason being is that Ron sees that I'm bleeding and my face is swollen while pinning down Fred with Jay, all while Antony is having a mental breakdown witnessing this. Ron says to himself, Fred would never hurt us like this. This isn't real. It's just a dream. He then proceeds to scream, Jesus Christ, at the top of his lungs repeatedly. The screaming triggers Fred to fight us even harder. Ron screams Jesus Christ and repeats Bible verses for at least three hours while Fred was trying to fight us. During those three hours, me and Junior are pinning down Fred who is tripping out harder and harder as Ron keeps screaming Jesus Christ repeatedly. Fred then screams and makes demonic throw-up noises while trying to get loose as a response to Ron's religious babble. Imagine this. One guy screaming Jesus Christ repeatedly and saying Bible verses at the top of his lungs, while another guy is actively trying to harm you as you pin him down all while you're tripping on acid still. It was a nightmare to say at least. The screaming, chanting, and constant fear of being maimed was all that me, Antony, and Jay could think of at the time. A recollects himself and begins watching Ron and calming him down while trying to get him to be quiet as the neighbors around our Airbnb are still awake. 11 p.m. hits and Ron snaps out of it. A few minutes later Fred then snaps out of it. I didn't know for sure if he was back to normal as he asked us for water and stopped fighting us. Me and Junior cautiously let him up. However, Fred has his back turned toward me. In case he went apeshit crazy again, I could quickly get his back and choke him out so we could restrain him. However, he's normal again. Me, Antony, and Junior experienced the chaos and destruction done by Fred and Ron who weren't aware of what they were doing during their psychotic trip. This trip made me realize acid is not for everyone 
and that we should have taken some precautions beforehand. Psychedelics can either be a heavenly experience or a hellish nightmare that won't end. Fred and Ron didn't realize how serious the situation was until we told them afterwards. To be honest, I'm not sure if they realized the severity of what me, Junior, and Anthony experienced that night. I thought I knew what I was getting into. But holy shit, I will think twice the next time I try LSD with anyone. We all remain friends to this day, but me, Anthony, and Junior will remember the nightmare hell of a trip that we experienced. This trip will forever be ingrained in my mind as the worst LSD trip I've ever experienced in my life. Needed to get this off my chest and thought this was the right place to post this. I'm staying at my friend's house for the weekend to spend time with him while he's back from college. He currently lives with his family mom, dad, and younger sister. While I was using the bathroom, I looked over to the right and noticed a black square adapter plugged into the wall facing me directly. I looked closer and noticed a black hole in the middle, kinda looking like a camera. I don't know if it's exactly a camera or just a small hidden LED light to show if something is charging. I then noticed it was connected to a cord leading it to what looks like a white charging block. But I honestly don't know what it could be, lol, if it's a camera. It definitely caught me staring at it and taking photos, so I'm a bit nervous. Plus, I'm female. It's scary to think someone could be recording me and could be posting it online for some money. I know he's not the type of person to stalk somebody, but also he hasn't even been home for that long, so I think it might be his father's. I want to bring it up and ask about it, but I want to make sure that I'm not overreacting. I have photos of the adapter if anyone is interested in helping. I'll gladly send photos to help. Update 1. Next day wow. I was not expecting this much help. Thank you so much. I'm currently still here at his house and waiting for my roommate to pick me up to take me home. I currently don't have a car. If I did, I'd be gone by now. But she's aware of the situation and is just as interested as me and scared. I do have one issue. When I woke up to use the bathroom, I passed by his the father's or mother's room and noticed what looks like a frantically thrown around room with cords all over the bed. I may just be overlooking, and this could be someone looking for their charger, but again, I felt it was important to say this. To answer some questions, yes, the back of the adapter had a weird set of numbers with Power Adapter Model S3 on top of it. When I put those words onto Google, it did come up recommended search for a camera. So again, I don't know if I'm just overlooking everything simply because I'm paranoid. But if any of you saw that and know what it means, please let me know. Thank you. Another question or misunderstanding. It was in the bathroom facing directly to the side of me, but did show the whole shower. Meaning if this is a camera. It's been recording people taking showers, not just taking shits. Some background info on the family. My friend that I've known for a long time is fully gay, and there's mostly women in this house all of the time when my friend isn't here in college. Unless he's snooping on his father, but I really doubt it. But I honestly think it's more likely the father. He does give me weird vibes. And as for the younger sister, I think she's 15. So if this is a camera, I will be infuriated. Yes, because I was recorded, but the moment I see others were, especially the younger sister, I won't be able to shut my mouth when it comes to confrontation. And yes, the family knew ahead of time I was visiting if this helps. I don't have an Android phone, but my mom does, so I'll probably use hers, lol, and see if I can detect the camera. Lastly, when I took the adapter, I also took the cords connected to it and the white block connected to the cord. Feel free to message me if you have any more questions. I'll try to update as much as I can, but I notice the thread is locked, which I don't understand. I'm not new to Reddit, but this is the first time I've posted something serious, lol. But again, thank you. It means a lot that people care, and I will update you all in a bit. Thank you. Update 2. I finally left, and guys, it's a camera. 
I took off the sticker on the back of the adapter, and there's a SD card. When I popped out the SD card, there's an a written on it. It's 32 gigabyte as well. I'm freaked out. I am freaking out. I told my friend, and he's just in so much distress. He's actually scared. I told him everything, including how I posted it on Reddit. Him and his mother want to see what's on it and take it to the police. Update 3. Hey, everyone, I'm sorry for the late reply, but I have some important info. So yes, we found proof of it being a camera and saw the footage on the camera with an SD reader you plug into your phone. I told my friend, and he decided to tell his mother to ask what to do, and she was completely distraught. She immediately contacted a friend who happens to be a lawyer for some advice, and she advised we take it to authorities, and we are planning to. While browsing the footage, we noticed it wasn't anything too revealing. And yes, I know it's still illegal to record anyone without their permission or knowledge, but it still helped us deal with everything a bit better. My friend decided to confront his father about it, but he admits a friend from his job loaned it to him a year ago, but quickly quit the company after suing the company after an injury and fleeing the country after receiving his money. Now we're currently trying to find proof that this exchange ever happened, and it could actually be this man knowingly gave an older man with a younger daughter and son a hidden camera to capture them and maybe sell them online. Allegedly, in theory, don't come for me. Now as for what's on the card, there were over 70 videos, different amounts of footage, and folders. Only one folder had the videos, but there was a WhatsApp folder that was empty, which was weird. A lot of it was black just showing the candle burning all day, but it did capture people using the bathroom. I try to keep updating as I go, but it's a lot to uncover for me. I'm still in denial about this, so I'm just going at my own pace as well as my friend's family. My friend said his dad was really upset once he was told his daughter, wife, and son were possibly recorded. So I don't know, take that as you will. Recently, my wife and I moved to my grandparents' home in a small Colorado town. They relocated to my uncle's house, and since my grandfather was a cultural hoarder, we decided to clean it up and prepare it for use as an Airbnb rental home, vacation home, or for sale whatever is decided in the future. My father joined us for the move and to visit my grandparents, which we accompanied him on. Keep in mind, this property had been vacant for six months and sits on 80 acres of secluded land. As we were returning from the visit, it began snowing, which added a touch of magic to the atmosphere. As we made a stop, I noticed in the dark some prints in the snow. Initially, I thought they might be elk or deer tracks and brushed it off. However, as soon as I let the dogs out of the car, they began sniffing the prints, and the larger one took off. I grabbed my flashlight and chased after him as he bounded away. I finally managed to get him to stop he somewhat trained, haha and looked down, realizing that those tracks were shoe prints about my size, half twelve, and they were recent, as the snow hadn't covered them to any extent. I began tracking them from the edge of the property by the highway road all the way to one of the sheds, where it appeared they had taken some vintage skis and apparently walked or used them. What struck me was how our friendly, loving, only a year old dog flipped out about the prints and how recent they had been. Since then, I have repaired the barbed wire fence that had been intentionally shoved over, and I regularly check for prints other than my wife's or my own. Occasionally, I have seen tracks that could maybe not be mine, but it's hard to tell at times. We have seen a dog on the property that is clearly not a stray, but never comes near us. It's healthy, has a collar, and seems to respond to a dog whistle that my dogs hear. Despite this, it still feels like someone is always nearby. But I have set up some small floodlights since then, and hopefully, that solved our guest problem. I do have some creepy paranormal stories and attempted pickpocketing stories, but having worked with severe mental illness clients and the homeless, I don't have many creepy encounters aside from some strange animals.
a 25 female recently moved to a new city, a trend that many people from my hometown are also following. Consequently, there's a specific group on Telegram for individuals from my hometown to find housemates or rental buddies. Ben reached out to me after I posted my expectations such as the requirement for a two-bedroom, two-bathroom condo, budget, etc. In the group, expressing his interest, he suggested meeting up first, and I thought it was a good idea to meet a few times before embarking on a house hunting journey together. So, we arranged a lunch meeting. During lunch, the only thing that annoyed me was his suggestion that I lower my budget. I felt like this was a waste of my time, as our expectations clearly weren't compatible. However, things took a weird turn after our lunch. While walking towards the subway station, he kept tapping on my shoulder occasionally. Though I found the frequency odd, I convinced myself that maybe that's just how he generally behaves. Based on our previous chit-chat, I learned where Ben lives, and he was supposed to get off at Station A and switch to another line, while I would get off at Station B two stops after Station A and switch to another line. Being relatively new to the city, I didn't realize he had not gotten off at Station A until I had to get off myself. He followed me off and switched lines with me, attempting to engage in different conversations along the way. One stop before the actual station close to where I live, I told Ben that I had to get off there to do some shopping and prepared to bid him goodbye. However, Ben followed me off again and accompanied me to the grocery store. Despite my repeated attempts to suggest that he could leave and that I was fine shopping by myself, he insisted on staying. Every time I turned around in the grocery store, Ben was standing uncomfortably close to me. I felt extremely uncomfortable, so I quickly grabbed two four-liter bottles of water and headed to the cashier. While I was paying, Ben took my water and offered to carry them to the Airbnb where I was staying. I tried to decline politely, but he wouldn't return the water to me. Not wanting to engage in physical contact with him, I didn't try to forcibly take the water back and allowed him to take them to my Airbnb which, in hindsight, was a mistake. Upon entering the common area of my Airbnb, which is a shared house type, I didn't even invite him in. Yet, he persisted in starting more and more conversations with me. At several points, there were complete silences, but he still wouldn't leave. In the end, after several hours, I had to ask him to leave. In the days that followed, he continued sending me weird messages, to which I didn't respond at all. After moving out of the Airbnb, I blocked him, as I didn't want to risk any potential issues since he still knew where I lived. I believe I narrowly escaped a kidnapping attempt tonight. Now that I'm safely at home, I'm starting to process what happened, and I don't know if I'll be able to sleep. I-25 female had friends from out of state visit for the weekend, and we decided to go downtown for drinks. Since they were staying at an Airbnb, I drove separately. Around 2 a.m., we decided to leave, and my car was parked in a garage a block over from where my friends parked. After saying my goodbyes, I began the short walk to the garage. As soon as I reached the corner, two large men started walking behind me. I tried to subtly put some distance between us. Suddenly, they whistled loudly and shouted, but I didn't see anybody ahead. Without acknowledging them, I started walking faster. When I passed an alley to my left, another guy walked out of it toward me. At this point, I was no longer subtly walking fast. I made it into the garage, parked near the entrance, and quickly slipped into my car, locking the doors. Turning around to look behind me, I saw the men who had been following me stop at the entrance of the garage and watch my car. They talked for a minute before spreading out and standing across the entrance, blocking the exit. I stayed put, watching until other vehicles started entering, forcing them to move. Seizing the opportunity, I quickly pulled out and floored it out of there. I might be paranoid but my instincts were telling me something was off as soon as I saw them initially. And now I can't sleep. Edit. I reported the incident to the police today.
In the summer of 2019, my partner and I both in our early 20s decided to take a road trip to Vancouver, Canada, and then stay at Golden Ears Provincial Park. We enjoyed camping, had spring break, and wanted to do something different to make the most of our vacation. My partner had never been out of the US, so it seemed like a crazy new experience. It was a six-day trip with Airbeams in each state, and the grand finale was a reserved campsite at Golden Ears, close to the water at Alouette Lake. We packed terribly, bringing along a giant tent, a bunch of fruits and veggies to eat healthily stored in a cooler that was too small, and a cutting board and knife for snacking while driving. We started in California, taking turns driving our bright red Ford Fiesta. We drove through Oregon and Washington before reaching Vancouver. We spent a day or two in each state, enjoying ourselves a bit too much and staying out late. Canada was the highlight, with a Lowette Lake feeling like something out of a painting. We walked barefoot on the rocks with our toes in the freezing cold lake, hiked around, and saw a beautiful waterfall where we spotted a couple taking pictures of each other for an hour. We started mimicking their poses from afar. Everything felt perfect, and the campsite was empty except for the other couple. That night, we went to bed early. It was quiet, but I woke up to crackling outside the tent. My partner was still asleep and snoring. At first, I thought it might be an animal due to the darkness, but the crackling got closer. I sat up, grabbed my phone, and accidentally blinded myself with its brightness. In those brief seconds, I glimpsed a person right outside our tent, unmoving and close enough to unzip it. I poked my partner awake, unsure of what to do. As they stirred, I heard footsteps retreating from our campsite. My partner, still groggy, began loudly asking what was happening. A car or truck parked nearby started up and drove off without turning on its lights until it was out of sight. Now, shaken, I wanted to leave, but Golden Ears locked its gates until 6 or 7 a.m., and it was only 1 a.m. We moved to the Ford Fiesta and slept there, tightly packed in the car. My partner fell asleep immediately, thinking I was being paranoid. But I couldn't sleep, sitting half awake in the passenger seat. Around 3 a.m., I heard a car slowly approaching with its lights off, likely the same truck from earlier. Fear and adrenaline coursed through me. The truck parked directly in front of our campsite, just like before. Feeling sick with fear and armed only with the kitchen knife we brought for fruits and veggies, I sat straight up, holding the knife at eye level, trying to appear angry and threatening. I stared back at the truck in the pitch blackness, reminiscent of the father in the American Gothic painting. The truck stopped, shining a light directly into my face. I stared back, terrified, holding my knife, not blinking. The truck then turned on its lights, blinding me, before pulling out and driving away. My heart pounded as I woke my partner, insisting we leave immediately. We hastily packed, sat awake until 6 a.m., and then drove home without stopping, trying to make sense of the terrifying encounter. Ultimately, we concluded that we both needed some rest. This event occurred when I was 16. I am currently an 18-year-old female. Our home needed renovations, so the builders informed us that the renovation would only take about a month. Thankfully, we were able to live in an Airbnb in the same neighborhood. I typically take the bus to and from school, and it's a very long walk to the bus stop from this new location. One thing about me is that I have a very poor sense of direction. Even if I have been taking the same road for years, it's still possible for me to forget the way. So, one day, I was lost walking home, and I accidentally found another route on the way to the Airbnb from the bus stop which added another 10 minutes to the approximately 20-minute walk. This context is important to the story. So, one day, I'm walking home from the bus stop, cursing myself out because it is minus 20-something, and I've accidentally taken the longer route. That's when I first notice a middle-aged man a good distance behind me. At first, I shrug it off because he wasn't very close at all, 
but I begin to get concerned because the route I am taking is not a regular one. It's one where you have to cut between houses, etc., and it seems too large of a coincidence. He is constantly behind me, even on the absurd route I am taking. At this point, I am scared, but I don't want to alert him because it's winter, and it is already getting dark out. I am not strong at all, so my chances of overpowering a grown man are slim to none. I pick up my pace, increasing the already pretty large distance between us. As soon as I round the corner, there is a fence surrounding the Airbnb, and there is a gate that breaks up the fence, leading into the neighborhood and where the house is. This is technically the back way, and you're not supposed to cross the gate. He has not rounded the corner, yet he is far behind me, so at this point, I sprint like my life depends on it down the sidewalk, duck under the gate, and hide behind the fence. I then climb the porch stairs and peek across the fence. It's a position where I can see the road or sidewalk, but they cannot see me. He bursts from around the fence, running probably because the distance between us has grown too large, and stops in his tracks when he does not see me. He pulls out his phone and starts talking, then goes back the way he came. Until this day, I'm not sure if it was paranoia or if he genuinely had bad intentions, but I'm still glad that there was such a distance between us, which is the only way I was able to run off unnoticed by him. Walking in downtown Atlanta from my friend's apartment to an Airbnb where I was staying with friends, I found myself alone. However, being a 6 feet plus, 225 LB male, I felt relatively secure. As I passed by a couple of drunk girls, I turned a corner when suddenly a van pulled up from behind on the street I had just turned off of. The van, a tan GMC with no windows, caught my attention. A man emerged from the sliding door of the van and began walking toward the visibly concerned drunk girls. The man was maybe 5 foot 7, skinny, and had a darker complexion. His race is not relevant to his likelihood to commit a crime, but it is relevant to include in case someone witnessed a similar event and can contact the authorities. Sensing something was amiss, I turned around and said, what are you doing there, in a commanding tone. The guy jumped, turned, and hastily retreated back into the sliding door of the van, which then sped off. I escorted the girls back to their apartment and then returned to my Airbnb. It was around 3 a.m., but the streets were well lit. I was in a nicer part of Atlanta, perhaps Midtown. I briefly considered the possibility that the van could have been a taxi, but the presence of a second guy in the cargo compartment seemed odd. Reflecting on the situation, I questioned whether I may have been profiling the individual unfairly by assuming he was of Middle Eastern descent. Additionally, it seemed illogical for someone to attempt an abduction in such a well-monitored area, with security cameras and doormen in some of the nearby apartment complexes. Perhaps it was a dare, and the guy mistook me for a police officer. Edit. I don't believe calling the cops would have been productive, as I witnessed no crime. It's not reasonable to involve law enforcement solely based on someone appearing suspicious. I included a description of the man I saw in case someone else witnessed a similar incident. I have since edited the post to remove any inappropriate or racist insinuations from my description. I don't consider myself a hero, as I didn't put myself in any significant danger. All I did was use my voice. Many potentially dangerous encounters can be diffused through confrontation. Sketchy individuals typically avoid confrontation. I felt it was valuable to share a story where a potentially hazardous situation was averted through practical, low-risk methods. Strange occurrences I need to find some sort of reasoning or explanation for. I don't know if all of these instances are related or connected somehow, but these are just some things that stood out to me. Are we potentially being stalked or recorded by someone in our apartment? I'm the kind of person that loves creepy stories of stalkers, ghosts, murders, encounter, and so on, 
and because of this interest it makes me have a pretty bleak view of humanity and always think that people are generally horrible and always up to something which makes me always be prepared to defend myself or loved ones. Maybe because I read all of these stories that I'm looking for it. So, maybe I'm just quick to think that something sinister is going on when it may just be something harmless. I'll let you decide. Anyways, I'm a college student and I basically live in two apartments. I stay at my brother's apartment a lot, but I mostly stay at my own apartment that I share. I live with my friend who is a pretty attractive girl who is basically a pixie fairy, which is a guy I know older men love to drool over. So, I always worry that since she's not as vigilant as me and really weak that she would be an easy target for a stalker or creep which there have been some weird suitors in the past couple of years, but nothing like stalking. So, today we got a Christmas tree for the apartment, and we were just chilling in the living room when we hear a sound from a device in the kitchen which is like two feet away in the next room make a swooshing sound, and then an Alexa-type male voice recording saying the word Venus. It sounded as if a device was turning on or off or something like that. We don't own any Alexa products or anything like that. We both have the female Siri on our iPhones, too. We both look at each other and say what the F made that sound. She kind of chuckled and said, did it just say penis? But I heard Venus. I go over there and see if one of our phones were over there. But there wasn't any mobile devices or speakers in the kitchen. I go back in the living room and we check our phones to see if one of us got a message on one of our phones, but neither one of us did. She asked me if I was messing with her, but I was going to ask her the same thing. This kind of freaked her out, and with my paranoia I immediately think if it could be some sort of recording device or something to spy on her because I'm not there a lot, and I was actually about to leave too. The only devices in the kitchen are a Consori air fryer the microwave, oven, and a Vecan water fountain for the cats. I search on the internet about anything that could have made that sound and said Venus or even penis, which wasn't a helpful search. But nothing useful showed up. It's exam week, and I usually go study at my brother's apartment, so I had to leave. And I didn't want to freak her out with my conspiracy theories, but I did. As I was driving to my brother's, I was thinking about it and remembered that about two weeks ago, we were talking in her room for a second when we both hear vibrating from a phone. I said someone's calling you, but she had nothing on her phone. I even look at mine and there wasn't anything on there too, but the buzzing was still going on. There are upstairs neighbors, but they are short-term occupants urban guests. But the phone sounded like it was in our apartment, but couldn't pinpoint where. It wasn't from upstairs because we only usually hear faint footsteps, loud bangs, or yelling and such because they are old New Orleans wood floors, but would not be able to hear a phone buzzing that clearly even it was laying bare on the wood floor above us. In my research, the only thing I could come up with that could have possibly made the Venus noise was maybe an LG Venus phone turning on. It's a burner phone that has a decent camera, but still shitty. When you turn it on, it makes a swooshing sound that may be similar to the swooshing sound recording we heard, but I don't remember it specifically. But the only thing is I haven't found a video of the phone turning on and making the swooshing and then saying Venus. Maybe it says it in a new update for the phone, but I don't know. That's the only thing that I could come up with which could potentially be terrifying if there is a cell phone turning on in our apartment that we have been living in for five months. Neither of us own an extra phone, especially a burner. Need to know what it could be. One last weird occurrence at this apartment was when I was about to leave I heard a weird noise come from the upstairs apartment, as if somebody dropped a bowling ball on a slanted wood floor causing it to bounce then roll. I just brushed it off as it was probably just some urban guests making their usual stomps and bangs from upstairs but I didn't know that there were any guests staying that day because it was 7 p.m. and I hadn't heard any noises besides that all day. Not even footsteps. As I was driving off, for some reason on that night I was curious if there were even any guests staying there at the moment. I decided to just drive around the perimeter of the apartment and noticed that all of the second floor's lights were completely off as if nobody was home at all. 
which was kind of weird because what made that noise a couple minutes ago. A few years ago, I searched for a place to stay on Airbin for about a week, but I didn't want a really big place. I just wanted a little bit of privacy. When I say privacy, I didn't want to be too far away from everything either. Some Airbinas were too much in the middle of nowhere. Unfortunately, my wife passed away suddenly from a short illness five months ago, so I needed to go somewhere different with my two kids, Adam, who is nine years old, and Emily, who is 12. We all needed a change because it was a really hard time for our family. Finally, I found a house near Austin, Texas. It has three bedrooms and a nice private garden. It's not too far from towns or people. The pictures on the website looked nice, and the reviews were all good. So I made a plan to stay there for two weeks and paid the money to make sure we could stay. My sister-in-law helped me pack all the important things we needed and gave me advice on how to take care of Adam, who has some special difficulties with learning that my wife was really good at handling. She knew how to help him a lot. Sometimes Adam would have difficult moments that were really hard for me to manage. My sister-in-law assisted me and showed me some ways to handle Adam when he was having a tough time. We had a little talk before our vacation, and it turned out to be really useful. But I have to admit it was all a bit overwhelming for me, beginning packing up and getting ready. It was a big move, like taking a step forward and saying goodbye to my wife one last time. I knew I had to adjust to this new situation somehow. I packed up the car with food, drinks, games, bedding, and last-minute things for the kids. The drive took three hours, and luckily, everything went smoothly. We arrived at a nice house with a long driveway surrounded by trees and a big lawn. The house had two floors, and it looked just as nice as it did on the internet. We got there around 5 p.m., which was when I thought we would. We went inside, looked around, and picked the bedrooms. Then both Adam and Emily were surprised when they saw the backyard through the big window in the living room. In the middle of the big lawn, there was a beautiful swimming pool with a slide. Both of them knew how to swim, so they really wanted to jump in the pool right away. I told them we needed to unpack our things first, but I didn't remember seeing the pool on the Airbnb website. But it was a nice surprise, and they both really liked it. We had a lot of fun in the pool and it was a good way to take a break and feel better after the tough time we had. I had to quickly figure out how to do things that my wife used to do for our family. My kids were pretty honest about not liking some of the meals I tried to make at the beginning, but I got better over time. After we finished swimming, I cooked some food. I think it was pasta. They seemed to enjoy it, and after, we sat around talking and watched a little TV. When it was around 8.30, I got the kids ready for bed and then came downstairs to have a beer. I was outside on the patio, looking at the pool and just relaxing while I listened to the breeze. The breeze was making a funny sound like flutes playing as it moved in and out of the trees. It changed direction and held in an interesting way. It felt peaceful, but also a bit strange, the sounds I was hearing. I had been sitting there for about 30 minutes when suddenly I heard the doorbell ring. I got up from the patio and walked through the house to reach the door. When I opened it, there was nobody there. I looked around. I didn't take a long time to get to the door, so I wondered why the person would have left so quickly. I looked out of the windows on the side, but I couldn't see anyone. I thought I should go and check on the kids to make sure the doorbell didn't wake them up. I went to see Adam first, and luckily, he was still asleep, but Emily was sitting up in bed. She asked me, Dad, who was at the door? I didn't want to make her worried, so I told her that someone probably got the wrong house number. I said she shouldn't be concerned and needed to go back to sleep. I closed the door, but I was still bothered by what happened with the doorbell. I went back to my seat with my drink by the pool, but when I got close to my seat, I suddenly stopped because I saw a person sitting in it. I walked slowly to the front of my seat to see who was there. To my surprise, there was a woman sitting there wearing a tweed jacket. 
She was wearing a skirt and looking straight ahead. Her hair was gray and wispy, and she looked around 80 years old. I asked her, Excuse me, why are you here? She turned and said, Oh, Mr. Wilson. I told her, My name isn't Mr. Wilson. She looked at me and said, You know very well. I kept saying, I don't know who you are or what you're talking about. I rented this Airbnb and my kids are upstairs sleeping. I've already told you I'm not Mr. Wilson and I'm not here to clean the pool. Then she stood up and looked right at me. She said, Don't make a fuss, Mr. Wilson. Just clean the pool like you're supposed to. She walked away along the side path toward the front driveway. I tried to stop her by calling after her. Don't come back here, or I'll call the sheriff's department. She didn't say anything back to me. She just kept walking down the driveway and turned right. And then she was gone. No flashlight, no light, and no sign of a vehicle anywhere. I went back inside the house. This was turning into a really strange first night of the vacation. I thought I decided I needed to get a good night's sleep. After making sure the kids were all sleeping well, I went to bed myself. I checked each door and window to make sure they were securely closed. During the night, something woke me again. I wasn't sure what it was, but I looked at my clock, and it was 2.40 a.m. Then I turned over and got really surprised because the strange old woman from the patio was standing next to my bed. She said, Wilson, the pool isn't good enough yet. After that, she walked out of the bedroom and went downstairs. I grabbed my phone from the table next to my bed and immediately called the police. I told them that there was someone in my house who wasn't supposed to be there. Somehow, an old lady had broken in while I was staying in the Airbnb. At first, the person on the phone didn't really believe me and even laughed. But after a while, they realized I was serious. While waiting for the police to come, I quickly went to make sure my kids were all right, and thankfully, they were fine. Then I went downstairs and noticed there was a wet trail on the stairs leading to the front door. I opened the door, but she wasn't there. Soon after, the police arrived. They searched the house and all around, but they didn't find her or anything she might have left behind. The scariest part was that there were no signs of her breaking in, even though I had carefully checked all the locks and bolts. I told the police everything that happened and described the old lady to them. They said that she might have some kind of memory problem like dementia and was probably confused. They told me that there were other houses close by, and it's possible she came from one of those. The police said they would let the other units know to keep an eye out for her and try to find her before she got into any more trouble. The next morning, I called the property owner, Carl Spencer and explained what had happened. At first, he didn't say anything, and there was silence on the phone. Then he spoke in a quiet voice and said, Based on the description you gave, the old lady in the tweed jacket was Mrs. Fitzpatrick. She used to own the house some years ago and was a widow. So I said, I guess you might have left some kind of home for elderly people nearby and came to visit your property. But then he said, Wait, it can't be Mrs. Fitzpatrick. Her pool man, Mr. Wilson, was found guilty of her murder when she was discovered floating in the pool. He got arrested, charged, and later sentenced to life in prison just four days after her death. Carl explained he knew all of this because it was a big deal in our small community back then. He bought the property a year after it went up for sale, thinking it was a good deal and an investment. As he spoke, I could feel the hairs on my neck stand up. I told him we're leaving right away and I expect a full refund. I spoke firmly into the phone, and the way he responded to everything I said made it seem like he had dealt with this situation before. I never really believed in ghosts or spirits, but after clearly seeing this lady twice, I'm absolutely shocked to consider the possibility of another world beyond our own. The only other idea is that I had too many beers to drink. But that's not true because I only had two for the trip. So that's not a good explanation. I decided to end our vacation early and found another Airbnb about five miles away. It was in a quiet wooded area just like the first one. 
It was hard to explain this to Adam and Emily. I can't even remember the silly reason I made up. But once they saw the police come in the morning, they started to worry too. I told them that the police needed to use the house for some investigation so we should leave. I quickly went on the Airbnb app to find another place to stay nearby that we could book quickly. I was really relieved that I found another place to stay. It was a really strange experience for me, something I've never had happened before. I haven't come across any other ghostly or spooky things in my life, but I can still imagine her standing over my bed just like she did that night. Thanks for listening. If you like our work, do subscribe because your support helps us keep this channel alive.